The Witcher Saga is one of the most compelling stories I've read. I generally prefer literary fiction and only bought the first book, The Last Wish, because the Netflix series got me curious. But it had not prepared me for how multi-layered an adventure it would be, and there's a lot to appreciate here. My analysis will be confined to the short stories and novels written from 1986 to 1999, which make up the main series. I still haven't read the standalone novel Season of Storms. Also, since there are loads of spoiler-free reviews for these books already, there will be no restraint on spoilers in this video. Besides, I'd like to contribute my two cents concerning the somewhat debated ending and why it works. Here are my scholarly thoughts on The Witcher Saga. The foundation of Andrzej Sapkowski's opus is built on the fundamental observation that if most fantastical monsters were real, they would pose an incredible threat to an ordinary warrior regardless of his armor or skill. But what if that warrior had superhuman reflexes to simply avoid getting hit at all, an assortment of spells and specialized equipment? And what would people be willing to pay for his services? And would he be seen not as a man at all, but as a mutant? or as a monster. I think the reason The Witcher is so compelling from the start is the world and the role the protagonist, Geralt, plays in it. For a story so large, it starts about as simply as it could, as a tale about a guy who kills monsters for a living and gradually builds its titanic narrative across the seven books from Monster of the Week plots into full-blown epic fantasy. The key to this transition lay in pacing and patience. The chapters of the novels are frequently as long as the short stories themselves, with scene breaks, which maintains the overall structure established by the short stories. Each chapter is introduced with a little excerpt from various fictional texts, or occasionally real ones, thus defining each one with a particular mood and character, and Sapkowski makes use of this defined structure to open subplots, and there are several chapters in the novels which are almost short stories unto themselves, such as Chapter 8 of The Lady of the Lake, which shows a pivotal battle through several point-of-view characters, including a doctor we never see before or after. Patience is well demonstrated in the first proper novel, Blood of Elves. Initially, this book doesn't seem to change much. However, we see the beginning of the derailment of Geralt's life due to his responsibility to Ciri and his futile attempts to not let that happen. A key junction point is in Chapter 5, about halfway through the book. The first part of it feels like another short story and a return to what we came to know in the first two books. Geralt has left Ciri with Yennefer and is back at work guarding a riverboat from a mysterious monster, and the royal orphan seems to have been nothing but a hiccup in his life. But men come aboard pretending to be guards seeking a fugitive who they claim is Geralt because they are trying to get their hands on Ciri. Things are about to get really nasty, only to be interrupted by the attack of the monster which, ironically, saves the situation. This clash illustrates the transition from one style into another, as Geralt's Witcher life is superseded by the importance of Ciri. The scene ends with... Pox. Geralt sat heavily on the deck. I'm too old for this sort of thing. Far, far too old. In the short stories, Geralt felt fallible, sure, but he also seemed able to bounce back from any kind of injury given enough time. This one bit of text brings in the whole idea of aging and change into the story and that it's time to wave goodbye to something that has become familiar, preparing us for the catastrophe in time of contempt. It's the kernel of vulnerability showing in the protagonist, who, by the end of the series, has a bad leg that never fully healed to complement his mental scars. An important thing about a series, or even just very long books, is the observance of variants, whether that be diverse character types or altering moods, because one mood maintained for 800 or 1,000 or 5,000 pages risks boring the reader. It's the difference between a popular song and a 45-minute symphony, and The Witcher is nothing if not varied. The very structure, which gives individual personality to a chapter, being extended to the books overall, each one having its own special character within the larger narrative. Time of Contempt is quite literary, in that it had a lot less action and fleshes out important details of the main plot. Baptism of Fire is basically a dark road movie version of Final Fantasy, and is in many ways where the meat of the plot begins.
friends and might have the most action. Even the titles of certain novels refer to a recurring theme within that particular book. Since each book has its own distinct feel, it's quite a forgiving series to take little breaks in, and a number of them actually begin with a new point of view character, a good way to draw a reader back in. In Baptism of Fire, it's Milva, and she turns into a prominent supporting character, whereas Applegat, the horse messenger at the start of Time of Contempt, doesn't survive the first chapter. Another prime example of variants being used to good effect as a tool to create unpredictability. This unpredictability extends to the bending of genre tropes. I predicted virtually nothing about the plot. And a primary reason for that is that Sapkowski isn't focused on subversion at all times, and you never know when he's suddenly going to play a trope straight. In the third book, Geralt is joined by a small band helping him on his quest, thus playing the traveling band of heroes straight, only for most of them to die in book five, burning the trope to the ground. There are genuinely happy moments in this series, and the harsh nature of the world makes those happy moments even better because the characters had to earn them. The world is what TV tropes would call a crapsack world, but because it's punctuated by good moments, it puts the characters under a lot of moral pressure, especially Geralt, who is, despite his seemingly calloused personality, the hero of this story. And it's his struggle to do the right thing that drives most of the narrative, first in the short stories, then in the novels. His his mistakes haunt him, but his successes speak for themselves. And it's not just Geralt who plays against type. Dandelion, easily written off as a wimp, is capable of incredible physical bravery. Unlike his show counterpart, I mean, I don't think we're going to see this Yas gear rooftop hopping anytime soon. No offense to Joey Beatty. Yennefer seems hard at times, but she's hard because of her life, and her heart is still capable of warmth and love, and we see how that creates vulnerability. Ciri is a sort of royal brat when we first meet her, but as she continues to get into adventures and tribulations, her incredible tenacity becomes her greatest quality. And watching her grow, seeing the moments that give her hard lessons or false ideas, and form her character is a huge part of the story. The extended cast are also very rich, coming in all shapes and sizes, with such a mix of playing to and against my expectations that the only discernible pattern I could find was the absence of one. There's Dijkstra, a big brawny guy who is a master spy and fiendishly intelligent, just as there are the typical lunkheads peppered among the gangs and henchmen. Regis is a vampire, but also a good person who becomes one of Geralt's best friends. I think he also embodies the importance of choosing our own path through life. Kahir, the misunderstood Black Knight who walks a thin line between deconstructing the noble knight and playing it straight. Sir Ike, the stiff but honorable and brave knight, unlike the moron in the show. Ugh. Good old Boreas Mun, the hired tracker with a conscience. There are wizards who look just like dignified gentlemen or ladies in scandalously revealing outfits, while there are others who have pointed hats and staffs. One even has a black cat. The monsters defy expectations as well. There's a werewolf who wants to die. And yet, there are monsters who need to be killed because they are dangerous and vile, and the way Geralt has to navigate these kinds of moral mazes is a highlight of the short stories, and a microcosm of the larger story, where he has to decide whether to be a bystander or take an active role in things. Something else I want to touch on about the characters is, there's a load of them, which Sapkowski uses to fill in blank spots in the narrative in a somewhat unique way. Stories, especially long ones, generally have their central characters placed in key locations, in order to show us the crucial aspects of the world and story, and place the responsibility of progressing said story on their shoulders as much as possible, which is totally fine. But Sapkowski doesn't go for this so much. Instead, his characters tend to be specialists within the narrative. For instance, creating a relevant point of view with that doctor I mentioned earlier, instead of having, I don't know, Yennefer help out in the surgeon's tent. Kings do their kingly things, generals do their general stuff, doctors perform surgery, witchers kill monsters, and no one feels larger than life, not even wizards and sorceresses who also have their part to play. I like this tactic because it lends a sense of realism and makes the world feel large and full and busy. Now, there is a downside to this at times, because despite this being incredibly well done the majority of the time, with characters from one scene or short story appearing hundreds of pages later without causing me any confusion, for the life of me, I could not keep track of everyone. There were a number of members of the Lodge of Sorceresses of whom I couldn't remember which witch was which, and they just kind of bled together for me. 
Perhaps future editions could benefit from a character sheet like my edition of War and Peace, or you could make your own. On that note, these books are free from the sort of extra details and techniques I've come to expect from fantasy novels. There's no map of the continent, there's no appendix, no glossary, or even footnotes. And this, despite the lack of that uh, character list, is one of my highest compliments for Sapkowski's skill. He manages to explain everything important only with the text, leaving out details that are unnecessary while making sure you're right with him following the narrative. And mind you, Sapkowski stays away from exposition for the majority of the short stories, doing almost everything with dialogue and action, avoiding exposition until midway through the novels, and it's a big part of that gradual alteration in tone which looks so easy on the page. And I think this makes the books more palatable for people who aren't fantasy nerds who enjoy poring over maps and glossaries even though I'm one of those myself. And the reason this stripped-down approach really impressed me is because there's actually a lot of magic in The Witcher. And it's a fairy tale brand of magic that completely defies explanation, and yet it has enough rules that we can sufficiently understand the stakes or limitations of it in individual scenes, due to Sapkowski's ability to drop bits of information throughout the text without ever hitting the reader with an info dump. Another thing I'd like to bring up, an aspect I'd even go so far as to call a trigger warning, is the sexual content. To be clear, it's not explicit, because Sapkowski is very good at implication, but I want to bring this up, because I've seen a number of reviews, usually by women, saying they dislike just how many of the female characters are interested in Geralt. A trope I myself dislike, but I feel like it was mostly fine here. The majority of women who expressed interest in Geralt are sorceresses who seem to be part of a sort of hookup culture within the magical community, since they can all ignore any consequences of promiscuity and there are plenty of lustful men keeping the scales balanced, and other characters who never seem to think about sex or love at all. I also think the female characters overall were incredibly well written and varied, so to me it was just another flavor of character. Besides, I'm also a little tired of this modern trope depicting women as very disinterested in sex compared to men men, and these books take the approach that not all women or all men are the same. I certainly don't recall Kalenthe hitting on Geralt. Again, the key word here is variety, so while I kind of understand this complaint, I'm not on board with it. Just uh, throwing that out there. Moving on to theme. There is a through line of the narrative concerning the nature of stories, and why we tell them that thematically begins by deconstructing classic fairy tales with the short stories. Numerous times the characters talk about the nature of stories and how they should end, and a comparison between how people want to remember the past versus what actually happened. That there's a difference between history and the stories we tell ourselves to feel better. The stories invented about the past almost always glamorize it. There are literally sections where events that are happening are being written down by Dandelion, and we see the difference. And this rather meta aspect of the books brings me to the last big point I want to make about the ending. While I was very unsure of what to make of it at first, and had to actually scratch my head for a while, it seems to me that at the end of the day, Sapkowski wants us to have fun. He claims to have no philosophy, that the things in the novels which seem to make political or philosophical statements, such as the continent being doomed to end in ice, are just there to set the scene, and when asked the question, What's the purpose of literature? To tell a story, or making money? <laughs> no, to tell the story and to please the reader. Maybe this really isn't a philosophy, however, I think it could be considered at least a principle. A principle that we open books to be entertained, and that's all he set out to do without making something that panders because that would also not be pleasing. So, Geralt and Yennefer are finally together at the end in what may be Avalon or Heaven because that's ultimately what we'd like to see after seven books, even though it had to come at the cost of the lives they had before. And the poetry of Geralt being killed by humans while being mistaken for an elf is both deconstruction and reconstruction. On one hand, the heroic fantasy is deconstructed because Geralt's heroic effort gets him killed by something as mundane as a pitchfork no less after successfully battling a powerful wizard. But it's reconstructed because he saved lives and does end up with his love after all. The story, after getting most of his adventuring party massacred, finally giving him some justice at the end while keeping a dose of sadness because Ciri is separated from them again, and many of the larger questions about destiny are unanswered. 
As for me, I must esteem myself happy to have been the first that rendered these fabulous nonsensical stories of knight errantry the object of public aversion. They are already going down, and I do not doubt but that they will drop and fall altogether in good earnest, never to rise again. Adieu. Over 400 years ago, Miguel de Cervantes deconstructed the knight errant in his milestone work, Don Quixote, thoroughly roasting a genre known as chivalric romance, which featured brave knights performing incredible feats in fabulous quests. And he did this by telling the story of an old man who read so many of these books that they turned his reason to folly and, believing himself a knight errant, wandered into the world to right wrongs, generally getting himself injured and causing only confusion and mirth, or outright destruction. As as he often worsened the lot of those he tried to save. There were no giants to fight, only windmills. Coincidentally, I read Don Quixote between the first two books and was struck by a comparison. A deconstruction of the Knight Errant by Cervantes 400 years ago, and then a reconstruction of it by Sapkowski. He acknowledges the difficulties of the whole idea of the wandering hero, but he creates a scenario where it can make sense again. I feel like Cervantes made a valid point that to live in a fantasy is wrong. No matter how fun it might be, life can't be like the tales of Arthur and Lancelot, but if we understand that we're opening the pages of a book containing monsters and heroes because we want entertainment, then we can just escape temporarily to other worlds to be pleased by the author. This, it seems to me, is what Sapkowski set out to do with the tale of Geralt, the flawed but ultimately heroic Witcher, and what we can learn from his work is that by just digging a bit deeper, by working a little harder for a setting and characters and injecting reality into their lives, authors can still give readers the heroes and adventures we may always crave. As Siri put it at the end, because there isn't a world where there wouldn't be work for a Witcher. But, as always, this is just my opinion. Let me know yours down in the comments and consider hitting that subscribe button, sharing, and all that good stuff. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.